God is conditioning you for the conforming that's going on inside of you. You think this pain is just about you. You think this struggle is just about you. God is forming you more and more into what Jesus looks like. Do you realize that, that your purpose pre, it, 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 it came before your existence? God knew you before you were born. There's some things that God wants to accomplish in you. And, and what I love about these verses is that he's not just, we, we get a lot of times hung up on our individual purpose. And, and people will say, well, I don't know what my specific purpose is. And I bring them right to this verse because this is a corporate sense of purpose. This is a corporate idea that this isn't just, you know, your John purpose, your Sue's purpose, uh, your Tim's purpose. No, this is y'all's purpose, our purpose, our purpose as a family. He says that I foreknew who you would be as a people. I foreknew that what you would do as a people. And, and it's amazing because the word is closely re related to the other word predestined. Both have to do with purpose in our life. In other words, he predestined us to walk this path, a struggle into glory. That was something he predestined that would happen. Paul, Paul said this uh, in another uh, book. He said, I want to know God and in the fellowship of his suffering. I want to know him in that power. That's what we've been predestined to walk. Uh, it is not that we go from mountaintop to mountaintop. We've got to be willing to sit through some difficult days because that's a part of God's plan and purpose for your life. And in the doing, he makes you stronger on the inside than you are. We cannot keep running from pain and running from sorrow. Sometimes you just need to sit your happy hips down and say, I'm going to just wait on God. I'm going to just wait on God. You know, the old saints used to say, I'm going through something, but I have found a place. And they used to say, way back in God. They were talking about when they would just go and say weird things like, I went and prayed, child, and I started holding on to the horns of the altar. Y'all, y'all, come on. Am I the only one that grew up in church where they would say weird stuff like that and it just conjured up these weird images like what are the horns of the altar and I just had these images as a kid like what is going on in that back room that way back place in God but all I know is that them old grandmothers would be able to stand flat, stand flat footed and no matter what was coming they'd just stand there saying mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Husband acting a fool, going to jail, kids smoking drugs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then they really get, they start holding that bosom. Mm -hmm. You knew they were going through then. <laughs> Way back in God. And that's what Paul is saying. He said, I predestined you to find spaces and places way back in God. And it is not going to be easy. You can elect whoever the heck you want to elect. Guess what? We are still scheduled for trouble. It does not matter what the pundits say. It doesn't matter what the climate is. That is what Paul is saying. He's saying, do you know that the whole, y'all ain't the only ones crying. He tells us at the beginning, the very earth that you live on is crying. Rocks are crying out and saying, God, it hurts down here because of the fallen condition of our world. And so we have to find these places way back in God. And that's the purpose of our lives. That's what God is telling us that, hey, that's what the walk was about, to walk out your salvation through all of life's challenges. And as we do that, what does the verse say? We are conformed to the image of his son. 
Now, this is the crescendo of Paul's thought. He's been developing literally all the way since back in verse 17. You can read it on your own. But, but he wants us to know that as this process unfolds, God is increasingly molding us into what he predestined us to be, image bearers of Jesus Christ. It was always his plan to conform us more and more into the image of his son. Come on, that's his plan. That was the thing that God had in eternity past, that we would be formed into the image of Jesus. I grew up in Anderson, Indiana, a little town in the Midwest, where basketball was a second religion. And I, I really do have fond memories of my playing days. It, it was a big thing uh, to play basketball in Indiana. You saw that movie Hoosiers. That's it. I mean, that's how it really was. And, and I loved it, but there was a part in the season that I absolutely hated. It was called preseason conditioning. How many athletes we got? Hated. Hated it. <laughs> because you didn't touch a ball for six weeks. You just out there running wind sprints and lifting weights. Once a day, sometimes twice a day, depending on if the coach was mad at us, all in an effort to get you ready for the season. And the coaches would motivate us time and again, say, guys, we're forming you. We're trying to get you molded into being a strong team. I know that those sprints hurt. I know that every time we run, you know, we, you feel like your heart's going to fall out of your chest. But it's in an effort to get you conformed into being a strong team. The coaches were using the conditioning to conform us into being a strong team. Are you tracking with me? God is conditioning you for the, conform, for the conforming that's going on inside of you. You think this pain is just about you. You think this struggle is just about you. God is forming you more and more into what Jesus looks like. He's taking the pain. He's taking the sorrow. And he's saying, I want you to look like me. Every detail of your life, the good, the bad, the ugly, all of that stuff, it's taken into the hands of God. And it goes into his process of conforming you into the image of his son. Why? He says, so that he, who's he? Jesus would be the firstborn among many brothers. Woo! Did you hear what he just said? I, I want Jesus, the one that we all revere, the one that we sing about, I don't want him to be the only one. I want him to be the firstborn among many brothers. You remember the prophetic word I just gave you at the beginning? It should have deeper implications. That you are not just here having a spiritual experience, that you are in the process. We are to collectively come together, form together so that we look like the body of Jesus. So that more and more we start reflecting what Jesus would look like if he were here on the earth. And so that's what he says. He says, I want Jesus to be the firstborn among many brothers. I know that when we think firstborn, we're thinking family and those kinds of things. But, but this term here, this usage of firstborn, Paul is specifically referring back to his teaching in Romans chapter 5, where he talks about Adam the first and Jesus the second. And in Romans 5, 12, Paul speaks of the consequences of Adam's rebellion against God. Uh, God, therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man in death, this is Romans 5, 12, through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sin. He continues, he says, if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. Adam's sin brought death. Jesus brought grace. He is the new, he's the second Adam. And you and I, we are children of the firstborn Adam, but we are what? Reborn, and we get connected to Jesus, the firstborn, and we become a part of his family. We become his younger siblings who operate in the way that he does. And so uh, listen to what I, I love. I love how N.T. Wright talks about this. He's a brilliant guy, but he says, so this is what it means, that 
The God lovers, the Jesus followers are called according to his purpose. The gospel shaped call of God to human beings is not in this passage a matter of rescuing them from sin and death, though of course it has that effect as well. It's about being called for a purpose that works not just for them, but through them. Why am I emphasizing this? I'm emphasizing this because I have a concern for our inability to have pain tolerance in the church. We, 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 I'm concerned when I look around and I see different ones just falling. And, and, and I know because I have personal application here that in a moment where I should have endured pain, I fell. And, 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 and so this has become something I'm really concerned with. Will we ever be a people that know how to just stand up under pressure and not buckle? Will we be a per people who know how to stand up under pressure and not need a drink, not need a smoke, especially in California, because you know we got the market cornered on weed here. You can get high going to the store. But will we ever be a people that don't bow our knee to CBD or THC or whatever it is? Will we be a people that can stand up under the pressure and just say, it's for God I live, it's for God I serve. And you know what? My life stinks right now, but I'm not bending. I'm going to just stand here. I'm going to wait till my change comes. And, and so my wife teases me all the time. She's like, boy, you got a high pain tolerance. She'll come up here and knock me upside the head with a pan or something. I'm kidding. But, but, but she notices. She's like, boy, you, you don't, you're not injured. You know, and it's because, I don't know, whatever. I just grew up in the fields working with my mom in the garden. I just have a high pain tolerance. And, and, and I am saying spiritually, we need a high pain tolerance. A higher pain tolerance. I'm acknowledging that what you're going through, it is a mess. What you're going through hurts. I'm acknowledging there's a pain that's in your heart. Some of y'all can't even sleep. I'm acknowledging that it's a gnawing pain. I know what it is to not be able to ever just totally, totally get comfortable. And God says, hang in there. Yes. It ain't about your comfort. It's because I'm forming you. I've saved you, but I'm not just bringing salvation to you, but I'm bringing salvation through you. And so notice what he says. We'll close with this. He says, listen, those people, they are justified. Those people are glorified. When I think about justified, I thank God for Sister Jimmy Curtis. Sister Jimmy Curtis was my Sunday school teacher back in Sherman Street Church of God in Anderson, Indiana. And she used to have us singing them songs. I am a promise. I am a possibility. I am a promise. With a capital P. Y'all remember that song? I am a great big bundle of potentiality. And if you listen... You hear God's word, if you're around, he'll help you make the right choice. He will promise to be anything I want you to be. You don't remember that? Y'all got to grow up in church. <laughs> you remember that song? But one of the things that she would do, she would teach us the theology of justification. And she would say, little guys, little girls, it's justified, never sinned. That's what justification is. It's he, he, Paul is saying, listen, you that are being formed, you're justified. It's just if you've never sinned. I know the enemy is, is taunting some of you because you're looking at the waywardness of your children and you're saying, did I do something wrong? Is it my fault? And the Lord is saying, no, you're justified. You are the righteous ones that the scripture talks about. And so I'm, I'm sowing this. I'm sowing this on purpose because I sense that so many of us are bound by past lives. We're bound by past sins. And we are trying to create a cause and effect thought in our brain where we're looking and we're saying, man, the struggle I'm experiencing right now is because the mess I created back then. And I'm trying to cut that cord with that demonic lie and say, no, you're justified. Don't you dare 
spend another moment carrying blame God never intended for you to carry. It is not your fault. God has redeemed you. God has justified you. It means it's just if you never sin. That means that the curse that should have been on you, those things that the enemy's trying to say, nope, God says it's all on me. When I suffered, bled, and died at Calvary, all that stuff that you did, it falls on me. You're justified. And he closes, as I said, if you will hang on in there, you not bow your knee to all the foolishness. You stay there. He says, then you'll be glorified. Oh, I'm done. <laughs>